An Aryan brother is without a care. He walks where the weak and heartless won't dare. And if by chance he should stumble or lose control, his brothers are there to help reach his goal. For a worthy brother, no need is too great. He need not ask, the fulfillment's his fate. For an Aryan brother, death holds no fear. Vengeance will be his, through his brother still here. For the brotherhood means just what he implies. A brother's a brother, till that brother dies. And if he is loyal and never lost faith, in each brother's heart there will always be a place. So a brother I am, and will always be, even after my life is taken away from me. I'll lie down content, knowing I stood, head held high, walking proud in the brotherhood. People that are older and know what time White it is, made. it's just business. Yeah. Greetings and welcome back. It's your host, Gabe Morales. We've been covering Aryan Brotherhood members over the past six decades or so. Today, we're going to cover the R last names, as in respect. Talked about it a lot of times before. I never make these videos personal. I always try to keep in mind that many people have family members viewing these things. But I also try to keep it real and call it as it is. Kind of like Clint Eastwood. The good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly. So you could take it personal if you want, but almost always I have documentation on stuff I put out. If I don't have proof, I always try to put in alleged or my opinion or apparently, etc. Not stating that it's necessarily a fact. So anyways, I do appreciate the majority of the people that show respect to me and as shown in the comment section. If you disagree with something I say, don't just put your stuff's all wrong. A lot of times I'll ask people to clarify what exactly is wrong and then they cite a 10 to 20 second portion of a 10 to 20 minute video. In other words, less than 1% is wrong. I don't equate that with being it's all wrong. And just because you state something doesn't necessarily make it right or true. We may just disagree at times on certain things, and I think that's okay. Today, I'll start off with Richard Rainman Rainey, who I show was out of Orange County, I believe the, the city of Tustin. I showed that he was a Nazi lowrider. His CDC number was C, as in Charles, 71715. I have notes that he was close to Donald Popeye Massa, who was with P9, public enemy number one. Sometimes these two groups were rivals, but occasionally they would also work together. It just depends on the situation. The Daniel, A.K. Danny Dog, A.K. Wiseman Rawlinson, who was out of San Diego. I show he was one of the very early Aryan Brotherhood members when he was housed at San Quentin, as shown in this picture here. I show he worked together with the Mexican Mafia, as often is the case, when Chavo Perez hit West Familiar members Juan Santos Leonard R. Yogi Arias in August of 1972. I'm unsure what happened to Danny Dog past the 1970s, so if anybody knows, I'd appreciate an update. There was Arva Lee Ray, a.k.a. Baby, who I understand was at least an Aryan Brotherhood associate, if not member, when he had BOP number 24303-149. It is stated that Arva Ray openly maintained a homosexual relationship, had mishandled drugs, and had disrespected Aryan Brotherhood members, all which were against AB rules. I also understand that Del Hevle had a strong dislike for Ray and told his homeboy Thomas Buzz Miller that Ray's relationship looked bad for the AB. The commission then ordered AB member Phil Myers to come up with a plan to take out Ray. Myers then promised Glenn Filkins, who at that time was not yet a full member, that he could gain his rock if he took out Arva Ray. I understand that AB members, including Snell Heavily, initially planned to kill Ray with rat poison, but decided that this was not a good method after they tried to kill another target, an inmate named Jeffrey Barnett, who did not die. So, instead, the AB decided to have Filkins kill him by giving him a hot shot of heroin. Understand that this was not immediately carried out, and Snell heavily pressured the assigned killers what was the holdup. Then understand that Glenn Filkins, with assistance from Buzz Miller, carried out the murder on August 9, 1989. But when Ray did not immediately die from the heroin, Filkins then strangled him with a garret while Miller held him down. After the murder, Filkins told Miller that he had been admitted to the AB and even showed off a shamrock ring as evidence of his AB membership. Understand that 
Buzz Miller later testified against Filkins and ABs in that case. It showed that James Riddenbaugh, a.k.a. Jimmy, who, I understand, was an Aryan Brotherhood member housed at Tehachapi in the late 1980s, during the same time frame that Blue Norris declared war on staff. I understand that he was shot by a CDC gunner on April 1987 while he was attacking another prisoner. And this is one of the first incidents that set off that war and retaliation against staff for all the shootings and confrontations that had been going on with CDC officers. I'll now mention an individual who was not an AB member, but in fact a member of the Aryan family in Washington State. And that was James Bradley Remington, aka Gear Jammer, who had BOP number 80124-038. The main reason why I'm including him in this episode is that he assaulted an Aryan Brotherhood member at Lompoc. And I recall this was a major thing at the time because, as you may recall, Kinnick gave his blessing to the Aryan family to start as the main white prison gang in Washington State. Kinnick controlled the Lifers Club which consisted of mainly Caucasians, which were basically the predecessors to the Aryan family. And when this occurred, I remember BOP and Washington State officers saying that it caused a lot of friction between the two prison gangs. I understand that he was housed at Lewisburg in 2010 and released in February 2022. He was out for a little bit and then got caught up in a case in Washington State, whereby he was returned to Washington, D.O.C. And last I checked, was housed at the Washington Correction Center for Men at Shelton. There was a Jamie, a.k.a. Mad Dog, a.k.a. Stingray Rhymes, who I show was out of Torrance, California. I believe he was at least an Aryan Brotherhood associate and got popped for assault with a deadly weapon in 1982 when he was given C numbers in Charles, 54335. I showed then he was housed at Soledad in 1984, but paroled in 1985. He then was involved in a homicide in 1988, but had paroled by 1994. I show he was back at Soledad in 1998, but paroled again in 99. Popped for dope in the year 2000, but paroled after that and had a few parole violations. But I show currently is not in custody. There was a Brenda Jo Riley, who I believe was out of San Diego. She was caught up in that first RICO case in 2001 against the Aryan Brotherhood and pled guilty to be in a courier for the brand. She also pled guilty to intent to distribute methamphetamine. Understand, at least at that time, she was the wife of Elliot Scott, a.k.a. Rascal Grizzle, who I've talked about in several episodes now. I mentioned the 2001 and 2002 RICO cases many times during this series. In 1989, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles declined to prosecute the case at first, reportedly because of credibility problems with informants the FBI had developed. At that time, a scandal had erupted at the Los Angeles County Jail over a snitch tank who it was found had fabricated much of their testimony in homicide cases in order to get their sentences reduced. It is no secret that many past AB and other prison gang informants have been coached about what to say and what not to say by their handlers. They will even sometimes record them on videotape to have prosecution witnesses view their verbal mistakes, tone, and body language. As I've stated before, verbiage is only a small part of communication, language, and of course, defense attorneys often employ the same tactics. Thus, the jury hears those who can tell the best stories and are the best manipulators in the case. These are little-known secrets amongst the public about what happens on the defense and prosecution side. Once discovery is made about what evidence each side has, some FBI agents even worried that some so-called AB defectors might actually be double agents seeking to infiltrate their witness protection program. In my experience, these are often called sleepers who will profess to distance themselves from their former organizations only get close to and gather intel on snitches and sometimes even hit their enemies. Understand that eventually the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms became the lead agency investigating the AB for those RICO cases. And a new crop of informants emerged, including an ADX prisoner named Kevin Roach, who claimed to be a high ranking AB councilman and had served under federal commissioners Barry Mills and Tyler Bingham, aka TDB. 
Apparently, Roach had expressed interest in flipping and cooperating with authorities. According to former Aryan Brotherhood shot caller John Grishner, he never liked Kevin Roach and always suspected that he was a rat. However, Grishner states that Barry Mills liked him. He was one of his kids. Mandy Fenton said, you know, he has a couple bodies under his belt. But Grishner states that his suspicions turned out to be true later on when Roach was housed in H unit, which was known as a rat unit or a super snitch unit. I understand that this unit was isolated and tucked under the ADX's central control room, and Roach was so active during that time frame that some guards took to calling it the Roach Motel. Only a few administrators and specialized staff were even allowed access to each unit. Still, contraband, including food, was smuggled into the unit, and eventually it was found out that one of these individuals was Officer Joseph Principe, who I did not cover under the P episodes because he was a guard, not an Aryan Brotherhood member, although some considered him to be an Aryan Brotherhood sympathizer who assisted the gang. Understand that a few months into the operation, another former shot caller named Danny Weeks had a falling out with Roach and was moved out of each unit as snitches started snitching on snitches and understand that kevin roach and other informants started getting their stories together for the rico trial tried looking up kevin roach under the bop tracking system and there's no record of him but other former ab shot callers like l benton had the same thing their records and current placements basically erased from the system at one time i had a lot of access to different intel systems maybe they have a super secret system but i don't have access to that but as far as I know, Kevin Roach is still alive out there somewhere. I show a Rodney, a.k.a. Shorty Ross, who was locked up in CDC in the 1980s under D number 4552. I then show that he was involved in a homicide of a 33-year-old Gordon Gaskell at Folsom Prison. And I seem to recall I had him in Ad Seg at New Folsom around 1991. There was a Michael Roll who was out of Sacramento. If you remember during the West Familia series, I mentioned that he was the brother-in-law, a longtime West Familia member, James Conejo Perez. But Conejo killed his brother-in-law with the assistance of an individual named Al Reyes in the late 1970s. I was told that Michael Roll was either an Aryan Brotherhood member or associate. There was Cleo Roy, who I believe was from somewhere back east and was involved in the shooting of New Hampshire police officer Ralph Miller on October 2nd, 1976, as Officer Miller approached his house to investigate a noise complaint. Roy was charged and convicted at a trial and, I understand, sent to the New Hampshire Department of Corrections. However, he escaped during his first year there and, I understand, was involved in interstate crime, whereby he was sent to the Federal Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. If you look at his face here, he's pretty baby-faced and I'm sure would have been an easy victim. However, he ended up joining the area Brotherhood and was considered an associate until he was involved with John Campbell in the killing of Aryan Brotherhood member Tommy Lamb at Marion. Understand they placed a noose around his neck to make it look like a suicide. The order to kill Lamb was given by California and Federal Commission members because Lamb refused to do a hit and I'm sure had other issues. I show that Cleo Roy had applied for parole in 2001, but the state board denied it, noting his atrocious behavior, including the homicide of Tommy Lamb. However, five years later, after him convincing the board that he had he was done with ABs, they granted him parole. There was Art Ox Rufo saying that Ox was out of Baldwin Park, which is just east of East LA in the San Gabriel Valley. And he was convicted of a homicide at the Orange County Jail and given C number 23189. I then understand he was housed at Old Folsom and then moved to New Folsom in 1987. If you remember at the end episode, I talked about Wendell Blue Norris. Well, Art Ox Rufo was very closely aligned to him and considered to be his enforcer and bodyguard. As I stated in that episode, he was my very first escort along with Blue Norris. Shortly after that, he was shot by correction officer David Pitts, who was working the gun on B1 Yard in June of 1987, as Rufo was attempting to stab a black inmate, a blood slash pyru named Adrian Lloyd. Later on, he was housed at Pelican Bay, where in February of 1996, 
he was killed by his cellie, Brian Healy, who states that he was tricked into killing his cellie under the pretenses that he had broken Aryan Brotherhood rules, when in all actuality, this was a personal order by Robert Blinky Griffin, who had always beefed with, with his one-time friend, Blue Norris, during the 1980s and early 90s. And so, I know that was kind of brief, but that's all I have for the R last names. If I left anybody out, you know for a fact as an Aryan Brotherhood member associate, hit me up in the comments section. I probably have some information on that. Once again, I appreciate your support of this channel as it takes a lot of work to put these episodes together. It's you guys who can keep me going by giving me the motivation that these episodes can teach something. Once again, I'm not trying to glorify anybody in these gangs. The brand or the tip, whatever you want to call them. I'm just trying to put some information out there as I feel there's a lot of incorrect information out there. Some channels being a lot better than others. And with that, this is Gabe Morales signing off for Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians. An Aryan brother is without a care. He walks where the weak and heartless won't dare. And if by chance he should stumble or lose control, his brothers are there to help reach his goal. For a worthy brother, no need is too great. He need not ask, fulfillment's his fate. For an Aryan brother, death holds no fear. Vengeance will be his, through his brother still here. For the brotherhood means just what he implies. A brother's a brother, till that brother dies. And if he is loyal and never lost faith, in each brother's heart there will always be a place. So a brother I am, and will always be, even after my life is taken away from me. I'll lie down content, knowing I stood, head held high, walking proud in the brotherhood. People that are older know what time it is, but it's just business. Yeah.